Any Avengers fans out there? Some of you guys? Who's seen Endgame already? Raise your hand if you've seen Endgame already. Wow. I saw it already. I saw it on Friday morning at 8 a.m. I saw it. And the reason why I saw it on Friday morning at 8 a.m. is because there were so many people who wanted to see this movie. That was the only time me and my wife Haley could literally get tickets. I mean, the pre-sale sold out. This movie is so popular. So many people wanted to go see it. And I was amazed to get to the movie theater at 8 a.m. on a Friday morning and to see the movie theater packed on a Friday morning at 8 a.m. I'm looking at all the people and I'm like, what do you do with your lives? Like, do none of you guys work? And they were probably all looking at me thinking the same exact thing. Like, what do you do with your life? And there was this moment when me and uh, I was standing outside of the theater and my wife had to use the restroom and so I was waiting for her and there was this man who was standing next to me and his wife was using the restroom and he was waiting as well. And she comes out and he's about to go and use the restroom. They're going to do like a switcheroo, except he almost makes a fatal mistake. Without realizing it, he starts walking straight into the women's restroom. And I see this, and when I see it, I go, oh! And it alerts him. He looks up, and he's like, oh. And then turns around and walks towards the men's restroom. And his wife, she looks at me, and she says, thanks. And I was like, like, hey, I completely understand. Here we are. We're at the movie theaters on a Friday morning at 8 a.m. I could understand. And she was like, well, he's especially out of it because he saw this movie last night at 2.45 a.m. This is a three-hour and two-minute movie. I mean, this guy probably got home sometime after 6 a.m., and here he is back now at 8 a.m. to see the movie again. And when we walked into the movie, I was amazed to walk into the movie theater at 8 a.m. and to literally see that there was not a seat available in the entire theater that we were seeing this movie in at 8 a.m. I mean, the place was packed. And here we are at church To ask the most important question you could ever ask in your entire life, what happens after you die? And we'll get about 100 people to come and hear about this question. When literally a movie where grown men will put on skin-tight suits and run around in a fantasy world and act like superheroes will sell out a (coughs) pre-sale. Guys, this is where we're at. And you need to understand this question that we're going to ask here this morning, this is not endgame. This is not a game. No, this question that we're here to ask this morning is real life. You may be alive here today, but you will die someday. And my question for you to consider with me here this morning is, do you know where you're going to go when you die? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus comes to a close, and he gives four sections, and what these four sections are all about is what happens to people after they die. So start with me this morning in Matthew chapter 7. We're just going to read verses 12 to 14 and study these three verses here together today. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. As Jesus comes to the close of his sermon, he calls his hearers to action. And the specific action that he's calling those who are hearing him preach this sermon to is right there in verse 13, to enter by the narrow gate. Now in these four closing sections of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to make it very clear that you are either saved or you are self-deceived. That's what Jesus is going to begin to discuss here at the end of Matthew chapter 7. You are someone who is either saved by Jesus Christ, and those are the people who are going to enter the narrow gate and go to heaven, or you are self-deceived, thinking that you're going to heaven, but really you're actually going to end up going through this wide gate to hell. And unfortunately, many are deceived. Many people right now are living their life thinking that they are going to enter the narrow gate to heaven when in actuality many are going to enter the wide gate that leads to hell. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Jesus says in Matthew 7 verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, the day when you stand at the gates of heaven and Jesus Christ is there, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, here's a group of people who die thinking that they are going to heaven. And when they get there, they find out that they're deceived. And they hear from Jesus Christ, depart from me, they aren't going to heaven. And it's because of two reasons according to verse 23. One, Jesus never knew them. These people did not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ where they were saved by him. And what showed that is they were workers of lawlessness. They didn't do what Jesus said. And that's why these people died thinking they were going to heaven, but didn't actually get in once they got there. And you might be thinking to yourself here this morning, at church on a Sunday morning, phew, well, good thing I'm at church on a Sunday morning. I'm not a worker of lawlessness. There's no way I'm self-deceived. You can be a worker of lawlessness even if you go to church. As a matter of fact, the majority of people who are self-deceived, thinking that they're saved and going to heaven but aren't actually going there, are people who go to church every single weekend. Go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus, he answers a question that is so important for us to consider here this morning. And the question that Jesus gets asked in Luke 13 is, Lord, Will those who are saved be few? Someone comes up to Jesus Christ and they basically ask Jesus, hey, how many people are saved and really going to heaven? And look at what Jesus says here in Luke 13, verse 22. It says, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus responds to this question in verse 24 and says, strive to enter through the narrow door. Same exact call to action Jesus gave in our text. In Matthew 7 verse 13, Jesus said, enter the narrow gate. You need here this morning to figure out, to make sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. And here he is saying the same exact thing, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door and look at what these people say. Lord, open to us. Then he will answer to them. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, and check out this shock right here. We ate, we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. What does that sound like right there? Here are these people, they're eating and drinking in the presence of Jesus Christ. They're hearing his teaching. I mean, where does it sound like they're at? Church. And Jesus says this right here in verse 27, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Here again is another group of people who die thinking that they're going to heaven only to find out that they are deceived. These people were in the presence of Jesus Christ. They heard his teaching. They ate and they drank around him, but he calls them workers of evil. So if there's only two options, you're either saved or you're self-deceived, how can you here this morning make sure that you are saved and not self-deceived? How can you make sure here this morning that when you die, you don't hear from Jesus Christ, depart from me, you worker of evil, you worker of lawlessness? See, truly saved people will not just hear the teaching of Jesus Christ, they will do the teaching of Jesus Christ. Self-deceived people are the kind of people who go to church and they hear the teaching from the Bible and they like the teaching from the Bible and they nod their head and they smile and they admire it and they agree with it, but then they don't go and do anything about it. Which one are you here this morning? 
Are you someone who does what Jesus says? See, I'm the kind of guy where I have a very unique perspective when it comes to sermons because I'm the guy who gives the sermons. And a lot of people will come up to me after a United Sermon, and some of you guys have done this before. You'll come up to me after a sermon, and you'll be like, Shane, oh, I loved that sermon. Oh, so good, solid, wow. You made me laugh. You were funny. You had that one part where that point, ooh, conviction, man. But then you want to know what the majority of people go and do? Nothing. They'll admire it. They'll agree with it. They'll say they like it, but then they don't go and do anything. Those are the self-deceived people. Those are the workers of evil. Those are the workers of lawlessness. See, workers of evil, workers of evil aren't just, of lawlessness, aren't just the people that go out there in the world and party and drink and do whatever the rest of the high schoolers are doing. No, the workers of evil, the workers of lawlessness are the people who hear the teaching of Jesus Christ, but they don't do it, so they break his law. That's lawlessness right there. And Jesus, what he does is he begins to describe the destination of those who are saved and those who are self-deceived. So go back to Matthew chapter 7. There's two gates, and your life is like a journey, and when you die, you enter through one of those two gates. And once you die, you will be there forever. There are no do-overs. Wherever you go, when you die, you will stay. And with both of these gates come three descriptions. So we'll start with the wide gate. Look at verse 13. After Jesus calls his hearers to action to enter through the narrow gate, he says in verse 13, For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. So when Jesus begins to talk about this wide gate here in verse 13, what you have to understand is the destination that he is describing with this wide gate in verse 13 are people who die and go to hell. So you can write this down in your handout. The wide gate opens to hell. That's where the wide gate opens. It enters, it's a gate that opens, and those who go through this gate, those who enter through it, they are going to end up, that destination, the place where this gate takes people, is the place of hell. Now I just got to say real quick here this morning that for the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about hell. And you might feel uncomfortable. You might not like it. You might get angry at me for some of the things that I'm going to say. I just want to make it really clear. As we talk about hell this morning, I am going to be the most uncomfortable person here in this room. I don't like talking about hell. If you like talking about hell, you are messed up. Because hell is not a good place. It's a place where no one should want to go. And so the fact that I'm going to talk about it doesn't get me excited. doesn't get me fired up. Oh, I can't wait to preach on hell. And the horrors that people will experience. No, it's going to be very uncomfortable for me here this morning to explain it. But Jesus brings it up, so we got to talk about it. Now, with this wide gate, he gives three descriptions. These three descriptions discuss what it's like to get there, what it's like when you are there, and how many people are going there. So let's talk about what it's like to get to hell. Jesus makes it very clear in verse 13 that the way there, the road to get there is easy, is what he says. The road to hell is an easy road. And the reason why the road to hell is an easy road, we'll throw this up here on the screen. The reason why the road to hell is an easy road is because if you go to hell, you don't have to do anything to go there. All you have to do is live your life and then die. That's all it takes to get to hell. Go with me to Luke chapter 16. Because in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about two men. They both die. One goes to heaven and one goes to hell. And this story that we're going to read in Luke chapter 16 is a picture of everyone in this room. Everyone here in this room, you are going to die one day. And when you die, you will either enter into heaven or hell. And look at how Jesus describes it here in Luke 16. Start with me in verse 19. He says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at this rich man's gate, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day, was laid a poor man named Lazarus. 
And Lazarus, this poor man who was laid at the rich man's gate, he was covered with sores. And all this poor man Lazarus wanted was to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. And here's a guy who's so messed up, he's living such a hard life. It says, moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. This poor man, Lazarus, he died in verse 22, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. That's a picture of this place called heaven. And the rich man, he also died, and he was buried. And in verse 23, he went to Hades. That's a picture of hell. And being in torment, that's what hell is going to be like. He lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Here's a man who lives his life. He's rich. He's got fine clothes. He feasts every day. And when he dies, he goes to hell. And this place of hell, it's described as a place of torment, of torture. And he looks up and he sees the poor man Lazarus standing next to Father Abraham in heaven. And he calls out and he says to them, will you guys just dip your finger in a little bit of water so that way maybe just one drop of water will come off your finger and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. Do you see how horrible of an experience this rich man is having in hell? He just wants one drop of water. And maybe that one drop of water will give some relief for the painful, terrible experience he is going through in hell. And look at what it says here in verse 25. But Abraham said to the the rich man in hell, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here. That's what heaven is going to be a place of. It's going to be a place of comfort, and you are in anguish. That's what hell is going to be. It's going to be a place of anguish. And besides all this, between us in heaven and you in hell, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. See, wherever you go when you die, that's where you stay. And so he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers who are still alive, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. See what this guy who's in hell is just begging of people who are in heaven? Will you please send someone to my brothers because I've got five brothers who are still alive and I want them to be warned not to come to this place that I am in hell because the experience that he is going through is so terrible, he doesn't want anybody else to go through it. And Jesus says the road there is easy. And that's what you get a picture of here in this passage. Here's a man who's clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, I don't think the Bible talks about his clothes and what he ate to get you to think bad about dressing nice and eating good. I don't think that's why the Bible brings up what kind of clothes he wear and what kind of food he ate. No, the reason why I think the Bible brings up what kind of clothes he wear and what kind of food he ate is because that gives us a picture of what this man is all about. This man is all about what he wants. He wants to look good, then I'll get the nicest clothes. He wants to feel good, I'll eat the nicest meals. I'll fill myself up every single day. You want to know why the road to hell is so easy? Because those who go there get to do whatever they want. That's why the road to hell is so easy, because you can live however you want to live. The word easy, it literally means spacious. It means you can bring whatever you want with you. Just live however you want. And you need to understand here this morning that if you're living your life based off of whatever you want, a life that is based off of desires will end in destruction. If you're living your life just whatever you want and you're giving yourself to that, Jesus is saying, that's the road that leads to this wide gate. And it may be easy, but the end is destruction. That's where this easy road that ends in hell, that's what the end is. The end is destruction. That's how Jesus describes what hell is going to be like. So what is this destruction? 
In Matthew 7, verse 13, Jesus says that those who enter through the wide gate, the way is easy, but the end is destruction. So what is the destruction? What is hell really going to be like? Because right now, there is so much misunderstanding about what hell, what people think hell is going to be like. I don't know if you ever heard someone say something like, oh, hell is going to be a party. You ever heard someone say that before? Maybe you've heard someone say, oh, I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be. There's so much misunderstanding about hell. So we have to ask the question here this morning, what is hell really going to be like? Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. It's the last book of the Old Testament. If you don't know how to get there, just go back to Matthew where our text is and turn a couple pages to the left. Malachi chapter 4. It's on page 802 if you grabbed one of our black hardcover Bibles here this morning. Malachi chapter 4 gives us a picture of what hell is really going to be like. What this destruction that Jesus talks about really is. Look at Malachi chapter 4 and start with me in verse 1. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. Do you know what stubble is? Stubble is like if you lit a piece of paper on fire, and that piece of paper disintegrated, and all you have are the ashes left, that's like stubble. Or if a man were to go home, and he were to shave his face, and the leftover beard clippings were to fall into the sink, that's what stubble is. It's the end of what has been destroyed. That's what stubble is. And this is saying... There's coming a day where people will be placed who are evil and arrogant into a place that feels like it's burning like an oven, and they will become like stubble. And then in verse, continue reading in verse 1, it says, The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Everything is going to be taken away. But you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, shall rise with healing in its wings. You who are saved, who are going to heaven, shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. stall. You're going to have this everlasting energy. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. You want to know what heaven's going to feel like? It's going to feel, hell, sorry, is going to feel like an oven. I don't know how many of you guys cook here in the room, participate in cooking. I don't, I don't cook. I don't participate in it either. I prefer to watch the art of cooking. But even if you've never really participated in cooking, you've probably had that experience where you've grabbed something out of the oven before. Have you ever grabbed something out of the oven, like a tray of cookies or brownies, because you're just so excited to eat them and your mom's been baking them? Has that, has that thing ever happened to you where you go to grab something out of the oven and your skin, like on your forearm, just barely touches one of the cooking trays in the oven. Has that ever happened? Where your skin just accidentally touches one of those trays? Don't you, in that moment, automatically just go, ah, right? You can hear the tss. You can see the little smoke coming off. And just that one little feeling right here on your forearm, it's enough for some people to do a dance and go, oh, Oh, that really hurt. It's not an enjoyable experience if that's ever happened to you. You want to know what hell is going to feel like? It's going to feel like your entire body from head to toe is touching one of the cooking trays in a heated up oven. It's going to feel like you're being burned in a flame of fire that has set you ablaze for all of eternity. And your body, it's like it's in this fire. It's like it's becoming stubble, but it never actually gets destroyed. That's what hell is going to be like. I want to give you four verses here on the screen that describe the destruction people will experience in hell. The first one is Matthew 25, verse 41. It says in Matthew 25, verse 41, Then Jesus will say to those on his left, Depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Two things that you need to know about hell. One, it is an eternal fire. That's what hell is described as. In the book of Revelation, it's described as a lake of fire. And somehow, I don't know how, but you're going to go and you're going to be burned in fire, but your body's not actually going to waste away. And it's going to happen for all of eternity. 
And hell is a place that was originally prepared for the devil and his angels because of their original sin. And now it's a place where everybody who lives in their sin is going to have to experience the punishment for their sin. That's what hell is going to be like. Matthew 25 goes on to say in verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The whole reason hell exists is because it's a place of punishment. Punishment for people who have sinned against God and rejected his son. Mark chapter 9 verse 47 says this, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. And then look at this here in verse 48. This is really weird. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. See, hell is a place of torment for those who didn't leave behind their sin. And this place of torment has this never dying, huge earthworm that's like a tremor. And hell, we'll we'll read a verse in just a second, is described as this place of outer darkness. How many of you guys were here at our church on Good Friday? If you were here at our church on Good Friday in the main auditorium, we talked about the darkness that Jesus experienced on the cross. And what Pastor Bobby did is all of the lights were turned off. Were you there? Did you get to feel the darkness? He kept saying, there's a kind of darkness where you can wave your hand in front of your face and not even see your hand. And because he kept saying it, I kept waving my hand in front of my face, and I couldn't even see my hand. And it wasn't like it was just dark, like I couldn't see anything. No, in that level of darkness, it's like you could literally feel just the heaviness that that darkness creates. If you were there, you might have experienced that. That feeling that darkness comes with when it just comes over you. Hell is going to be a place of outer darkness. Could you just imagine what it would be like for you to be in this place of an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels in outer darkness and then all of the sudden you can't see anyone or anything and then all of the sudden you feel something huge and slimy just run against you. And you're like, what in the world? What was that? Where did that come from? That's this hell worm. It's going to be in hell literally to torture people forever. So that way, they will experience the punishment and the payment for their sins. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus says this in verse 10, or sorry, in verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not only will hell be a place of outer darkness, but it will be a place where people are experiencing such terrible pain that in order to distract them from the pain they're experiencing, they will gnash their teeth. They'll be grinding their teeth back and forth because they can't handle what they are going through. That's what hell is going to be like. And you might think to yourself, whoa, that sounds intense. That sounds harsh. Why are we talking about this here on a Sunday morning? Why are you bringing this up, Shane? Do you want to know who was the one speaking in all four of those verses? The reason why I picked those specific four verses is not only because they describe the destruction, but because Jesus is the one who is describing what hell is going to be like. Did you know Jesus Christ talked about hell almost more than anything else he talked about? As a matter of fact, if you count it up, how many times Jesus talked about heaven and then how many times he talked about hell, he talked about hell almost twice as many times as he talked about heaven with detailed descriptions of what it's going to be like. You want to know why Jesus talked about hell so much? Because so many people are going there and Jesus doesn't want people to go there. And the reason why we're talking about hell here this morning It's because there's people here in this room that are going there. Some of you, you sit here in these seats, and today you know you're going to hell. Some of you, you sit here in these seats, and you're self-deceived, and you don't even know. You'd like to think you're going to heaven, but in the back of your mind, you're kind of doubting, and you're not really sure. Jesus makes it very clear that many people will enter the wide gate that leads to destruction. And he doesn't want anyone to go there. And he doesn't want anyone to go there so much that he's willing to talk about it 
And he's willing to die for your sins so that way you wouldn't have to go there. See, for 15 years of my life, I was this self-deceived person. I grew up in a Christian home, Christian parents, church every single weekend. If you came up to me and asked me when I was a freshman, what's going to happen to you after you die? Do you know where you're going? I would have said, yeah, I'm going to heaven. But you want to know the truth? In the back of my mind, I always kind of doubted. I wasn't sure. I didn't have confidence. I would have told you that I was going to heaven, but in the back of my mind, I really actually kind of questioned if I was truly going there. And I remember when I was a sophomore in high school, I heard the gospel clearly preached by Pastor Bobby, and God opened my eyes to see that I was a self-deceived person. And even though I was saying I was going to heaven, if I died in that moment, I would go to hell. And now I can stand here today before all of you guys and I can say, I know what will happen to me after I die. I know where I'm going. If someone were to walk through that door and hate Christians and want to shoot all of us, if we say we're Christians, if they put a gun in my face and said, are you a Christian? I would look at them in the eyes and I would say, pull the trigger because I know where I'm going when I die. Do you? Do you know where you're going to go? Because many people are self-deceived, thinking that they're going to heaven when the reality is this is the horror that they are going to experience for all of eternity. And it's possible that in a room like this, you could be one of those self-deceived people. And I got to make it really clear that hell is a place that you do not want to go to. You might hear this morning, know you're going to hell or have a doubt about going to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. Heaven is the place that you want to go to. Can we talk about heaven for a couple of minutes now? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. And let's look at this narrow gate that Jesus makes it very clear. This is the gate that leads to heaven. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus starts to describe this narrow gate. The first gate is wide. Many will enter, and it opens to hell. The second gate is described in verse 14, and Jesus describes it like this. Look at verse 14 of Matthew chapter 7. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. This narrow gate that he starts to describe here in verse 14, it opens to heaven. You can write that down in your handout. The narrow gate opens to heaven. And this is the place that you want to go to here this morning. This is the place that when you die, you want to know, you want to have confidence, you want to be certain that this is where you will end up, heaven, through this narrow gate. This is the gate you want to enter. But Jesus makes it really clear that the road to get there, the way to get there is hard. So the narrow gate opens to heaven, but the road to heaven is hard. That's what Jesus makes so clear. See, the way to hell is easy because the road is spacious. You can do whatever you want. You can bring whatever you want. But the road to heaven is hard. Go with me to Luke chapter 9 in your Bible. See, the road is so hard that many people will say they want to go to heaven, but they will decide not to take the road to get there because it's going to be such a hard road. And in Luke chapter 9, we get a story of three different men who say to Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved when I die. And Jesus makes it really clear what that actually means. And the sad thing is, because the road is so hard, it seems like all three of these men end up walking away from Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 57. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, does that sound like a good statement right there? Someone comes up to Jesus Christ and is like, Jesus, I'm with you wherever you go. You would think at that moment, Jesus would be like, ooh, yay, got one. No, look at what Jesus does right here in verse 58. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here's the first, the first man, he comes up to Jesus Christ and he says to Jesus Christ, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says back to him, really? 
because I have nowhere to lay my head. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Is he saying that he's homeless? Is that what he's saying? No, that's not what he's talking about. What Jesus is making very clear is that he has no consistent place to lay his head because he's so busy traveling all the time, trying to help people get saved, that he doesn't have a consistent bed that he can go and sleep in. And so he says to the guy, hey, foxes, they have holes. Birds, they have nests. They can go, they can sleep, they can live a comfortable life whenever, wherever they want. Me? My whole mission in life is to preach the gospel so people will get saved. And that means I'm going to have to live an uncomfortable life because I might have to go wherever. See, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, that means you need to be willing to go wherever he tells you to go. Wherever. And before you say here this morning, yeah, I think I'd go on a missions trip to Africa. I'd do it. Hey, that's great that you would go on a missions trip to Africa, to a place where you know probably no one. So if they reject you, it's not going to cost you anything. But would you go home to your family today and tell them that you got saved and are living for Jesus Christ? Would you go to your friends that you sit next to in class at school and share the gospel with them and tell them they need to repent, even if they might reject you and you might have to sit next to them all school year long and experience a lot of awkward tension? See, that's where you need to be willing to go. It's easy to say, send me, I'll go. People in Africa need to get saved, I'm on it. But what about the people you sit next to in your class? What about your old friends who aren't Christians? Maybe you've got a relationship here in this room and you're with someone that you know isn't a Christian. Are you willing to go to them and go wherever Jesus tells you? To the second man, Jesus says in verse 59, Jesus calls this man, look at verse 59, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So here's a man that says he's going to follow Jesus Christ. He just wants to first go and bury his father. That sounds reasonable, right? Jesus says in verse 60, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, Jesus goes to the second man and calls him to follow him. And this guy says, okay, I'm in. Just first, let me go and bury my dad. And many people would say the reason why this man wants to bury his dad, what he means is he wants to wait for his dad to die, not just so that he can bury him and send him off, but because when his dad dies, the son will receive the inheritance. So what this guy really wants is he wants the money. And so he's saying to Jesus, I'll follow you, I'll go with you, but first, let me just go get the inheritance that is rightfully mine. And Jesus says, hey, leave the dead to bury their own dead. You need to go and you need to preach the gospel. You need to proclaim the kingdom of God. See, what Jesus is getting at here is, are you really ready, willing to do whatever he says? Are you willing to leave behind something like money, something that would seem like a good thing that might be rightfully yours? Are you ready and willing to leave that behind? Because that's what it's going to take to follow Jesus Christ. You've got to be ready and willing to go wherever. And you've also got to be ready and willing to do whatever. Jesus calls you to leave a sin behind. Are you really ready to leave it? Even if it's going to be hard, even if it's going to be tough, Even if in your own flesh you feel like you don't want to, are you really ready and willing to do it? And then to the third guy, it says this in verse 61, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus says to him in verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here again, the third man, he promises that he will follow Jesus. He just wants to go home first and say goodbye to his family. And Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow, no one who says, you're going to follow me, but keeps looking back at your old life, is really ready to follow me. And isn't that what, I hear people say that all the time. I don't know if you ever heard someone say something like that. Hey, I'll get serious about religion when I'm older. Let me just wait. And then I'll get serious about religion. Or I hear a lot of young people say, I'll become a Christian. I just want my non-Christian girlfriend to get saved first so that way we can stay together. 
or I'll become a Christian. I just want this person to get saved as well, so that way I don't have to lose that relationship. And Jesus says to this man who says, I will follow you, just first let me go home and say farewell to my house. No one who puts his hand to the plow, who says you're going to follow me and looks back at your old life is really ready. So you've got to be willing to go wherever, do whatever, and leave whenever. That's what Jesus is saying it means to follow him. That's why the road is hard. Because these three guys are thinking to themselves, I want to go to heaven, but Jesus is showing them what the road to get there really looks like. You might be sitting here this morning thinking, I want to go to heaven. I want to be able to say with complete confidence, I know that when I die, I will enter through the narrow gate. Do you realize what the road is going to look like for you? It's going to be hard. You've got to be ready and willing to do whatever Jesus asks of you. Is that you here this morning? Wherever, whatever, whenever. That's what Jesus says it's really going to mean to follow him. The road might be hard, but it's worth it. And the reason why the road is worth it, even though it is hard, is because the end is life. The end of this road, it leads to life. You want to know what heaven is going to be like? Here's what heaven is going to be like. You could describe it in one word. It's going to be like life. That's how you could describe heaven. Not just eternal life, ongoing, never ending. No, it's going to be a quality of life unlike anything you've ever experienced. Where all wrongs are made right. Where all old is made new. Where every imperfect thing is made perfect. Go with me to Revelation chapter 21. See, I've met some people who have said to me, I don't really know if I want to go to heaven because heaven sounds boring. I don't know if you've ever heard someone say that before. And the picture that they have in their mind is that we're all just going to be sitting on clouds, wearing adult diapers, playing harps, and shooting arrows at each other. That's the picture that they have in their mind of what heaven is going to be like. See, every time someone says to me, heaven sounds boring, you want to know what I say to them? Then you don't know what heaven's going to be like. Because trust me, heaven is not going to be boring. Look at Revelation chapter 21. The Bible describes what heaven's going to be like in verse 1. It says in Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You want to know what heaven's going to be? It's going to be everything about planet earth but made new. That's what heaven's going to be. It's going to be earth 2.0. You love all of those amazing sunsets cruising down PCH? Yeah, imagine seeing it perfectly. That's what heaven's going to be like. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Here's heaven, and here's how it's described. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You want to know what heaven's going to be like? Heaven is a place where God himself is going to dwell and live among people. Heaven is going to be a place where there will be no barriers, no separations, no distance between anybody who is there and God. He will live among the people. So you want to know what heaven is? Heaven is not about the perks. Heaven is about the person. I hear people say all the time, ooh, I'm just so excited about this for heaven, the streets of gold. Ooh, I'm just so excited about the perfect food in heaven can't wait for it. That's not what heaven's about. Heaven is not about the perks. It's about the person. It's about the fact that you get to be with God for all of eternity. So I've got a question that I want to ask you here this morning, and someone's asked me this question, and I've heard it before from different people, and this is a very important question for you to consider. If you could have heaven with the streets of gold, no more death, no more crying, no more pain, Everything is perfect, but Jesus Christ is not there. Would you still want it? Think about that. 
You could have a place of perfection. No more disease, no more pain, no more crying, no more wrong things, no more evil, no more bad. You could have it all, but Jesus Christ, he just isn't there. You still want to go to that place? See, if your answer to that question is yes, then you're not going to be able to endure the row that it takes to get there. Because the only thing that will get you to heaven is a love for Jesus Christ as your Savior. That is the only thing that is going to cause you to endure the hard row that it takes to actually get to heaven. Is a longing to be with the one that your soul loves. When this life gets hard and the road that you're taking to get to heaven is brutal, and you're thinking about giving up, the only thing that is going to make you not give up is the thought that someday I will get to see Jesus, and I will be with him for all of eternity, and I love him, and I so badly want to be there with him. Heaven's supposed to be about Jesus Christ, and he makes it really clear that only few will find it. Only few people are actually going to go to heaven when they die. So the narrow gate, it opens to heaven. The road is hard. Its end is life, and only few will find it. And you may think here this morning that you have two choices. Hearing all of this, you might think to yourself that you have a choice between heaven and hell. That is not the case here this morning. Although there may be two gates, a wide gate that opens to hell and a narrow gate that opens to heaven, there is only one way. And his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one's getting to heaven unless you go this road through Jesus Christ. So you don't have two choices here today between heaven and hell. You've got one choice. Are you going to respond to Jesus Christ? He's made it really clear what it means to follow him, wherever, whatever, whenever. Are you ready and willing to do those three things, to leave your sin behind and give him all of your life? Because that's what it means to respond to Jesus Christ. And if you don't respond to Jesus, every one of you here this morning, when you leave this room, you will either leave having responded to Jesus Christ or you will leave rejecting him. And you might think to yourself, rejection? Ooh, I don't know about that. That's an intense word. I don't know if I would describe myself as rejecting Jesus. If you don't respond, that is rejection. No response is rejection. Isn't that how you feel when you send someone a text message and you can see that they read it because they've got their red receipts on, but they don't reply? You're like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. Feels like rejection, right? Write this down in your handout for the third blank. Don't leave Jesus on red. You here this morning have read the words of Christ. You've heard the words of Christ. Don't leave him on red. Respond to him today. If you know here this morning that you're going to go to hell when you die, respond to him. Follow him. Give him your life. Turn from your sin. Do what he tells you to do. If you're not sure about where you're going to go when you die, What we actually want to do right now, we've got a couple of minutes before our service is over, and we want to end here this morning. We want to end our service a little early just to give you an opportunity to talk about this with the people around you. And what we want to talk about right now with the people around you is do you know where you're going? Hey, what do you think about this? You got one choice. Are you going to respond to Jesus Christ? Two gates. You're going going through one of them. Do you know where you're going? And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to end right now. I want you to grab a group of two or three guys or two or three girls and just spend the next 10 to 15 minutes talking about what you think. And then I'll come back up here. I'll close this in a word of prayer. And I just want this to be a time, and I encourage you just to share what you really think about what we talked about here this morning. So I'm going to end right now and grab a group of two or three people, and then I'll come back up and I'll pray for us here this morning to close out our service.